So welcome to our session on classification. This session is organized by uh, our um, ISAC group in Kiel. Um, uh, uh, Martin, just to remind me, what does it mean? Initiative for Statistic Analysis in Archaeology, Kiel. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, have to, uh, to ask every time, um, because it's much too long to remember for me. Um, and um, this is a session which is organized by a lot of different people, and uh, the two of us are standing in front of you, uh, and we just represent the whole group. Uh, I understand this is a kind of new uh, organizational format for CAA, but uh, we think this is the right thing to do. It. It's more democratic uh, as a tradition approach. Um, classification. Why do we bother to deal with classification? We start with the second answer, the less important answer. Um, typology, which is a kind of classification, is still very important in archaeology. But of course, this is not the, the proper reason for doing it. The real reason is, um, Classification is required to be able to make universal proposals. And this is uh, something which is uh, uh, essential for uh, most parts of academic reasoning. And if you want to, uh, to make such universal proposals, uh, we need to define uh, certain terms based on, uh, on features uh, of the elements which are grouped together uh, in this uh, term. Um, and even if I say um, most vessels of type A belong in phase uh, 3 uh, or something like this, um, this requires uh, a classification. It's a very fuzzy um, proposal, proposition, but uh, it requires a classification. So classification is very important. <laughs> And it is in particular important for archaeology. Uh, I named it. Typology is something we still use. But in archaeology, the numerical classification uh, is something which is very important too. The reason is that we, archaeology, is standing in between the two um, types of research. Um, the scientific research and the other pillar, uh, the humanities. Um, scientific research is based on the idea of pattern recognition. We are looking at uh, certain sets of data and try to uh, get what's inside the, uh, the data. We want to extract the structure inside the data and then we do something with this. Uh, we interpret it, we build theories uh, on top of the structure. In humanities, Go the other way around. We start with an idea, with um, something meaningful, and negotiate uh, the relationship between the different uh, terms and ideas. Archaeology has the problem that our finds do not have meaning attached to it. So we need to apply the scientific approach. We need to um, we cover the structure inside the data as basis of our interpretation. Pattern recognition and numerical classification are um, has a very important um, uh, tool for archaeology. <coughs> the field of statistics in archaeology, the field of statistics in general, is changing. Uh, in archaeology, um, we are moving more towards quantitative archaeology, which uh, includes um, a certain case studies and applications, um, and uh, less computational archaeology in the sense of just computing something. Uh, uh, <coughs> computation is done by strange guys who are not connected to the actual uh, archaeological research. So we are moving towards integration of calculation of uh, method on the one hand and uh, application on the other hand. 
statistics in general is also changing. Uh, it's changing towards a general data science. And it's uh, similar to what's, happened, to what's happening in archaeology. Uh, statistics is something done by specialists. Uh, it's a, a branch of mathematics. Um, while data science starts at the other end, it starts at the application and applies statistics as a certain method, as a certain approach. So here we also see a certain integration of uh, methods, of uh, algorithms, of techniques on the one hand, and of uh, archaeological, uh, or, sorry, of uh, applications in general on the other hand. Um, statistics is forced to do this in a certain way. On the right hand, you see two publications. Uh, the first states that most publications of statistical analysis in medicine is wrong. And even if we don't agree with most, um, uh, we have to admit that there are certain problems. And the problem is that um, the methods on the one hand and the applications on the other hand are not um, uh, integrated. Uh, there are certain methodological ideas which are blindly applied in case, certain case studies. Um, so we have to look at uh, the integration of methods inside um, the applied study. And the more specific uh, problem is a p-value issue. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard about it, and um, of course there's nothing wrong with p-values, but uh, there is something wrong with the application of p-values in uh, different um, research scenarios. So it's the same again. Um, we like a proper integration of the um, theoretical background of the method and the um, research objectives of the uh, uh, case study. Um, and here's what we really need, a balance of objective, of data, of theory and method. If we pick out just one thing, uh, as for example in traditional statistics, we pick out just the method, uh, then this will never work. We uh, don't have a proper connection to the other uh, pillars of research. Um, and the same is uh, if we uh, focus just on theory or uh, something else. Uh, it never will work uh, because we need the uh, entire integration of uh, these four uh, pillars of research. Here we have four. Um, um, uh, four things we have to do to integrate um, those four pillars. Uh, we need a deeper methodological understanding. And this is why we have this session. We want to explore the different methods and approaches of classification. Uh, we need a sound critic of the methods. We need a methodological systematization, um, a systematic which tells us which approach is suitable for which research scenario. And finally, we need to think about the connection between uh, the four different pillars. Now I want to give some rather bad examples. Um, I'm sure most of you have heard sentences like this. Uh, cluster analysis always provides results which is meant as a critic, but of course, if something always uh, produces results, it's a good thing. What, what is meant <coughs> is uh, that we also need a validation of the results. We need to be sure that the results are uh, uh, fulfilling certain requirements. The problem of this uh, statement is that the critique does not address the, uh, the actual problem. It says something which is connected to the problem, but it, uh, it does not state um, what is the problem itself. 
And you all know those people who tell you that you should uh, apply uh, fancy new methods. Uh, and don't stick to the old approaches. Uh, we have new approaches which are um, uh, much more fashionable. So uh, move on to the new method. But perhaps you should think about what uh, those methods are doing. Uh, in this example, uh, if I get the advice to move to neural networks, this is a bad advice uh, if I want to understand what's happening. Uh, neural networks produce a, a very nice result, a very good result, but I do not understand why. So this is not the, the proper uh, approach. If I um, want to recover the internal mechanisms uh, of the processes I'm studying. Here the problem is obviously that critique does not consider the purpose of research. The third example, try different clustering algorithms and if all agree, uh, you can trust in the design. Um, obviously this is wrong because uh, different clustering uh, algorithms do not represent the same method. They uh, assume different kinds of uh, clusters, uh, and hence each clustering method, each clustering um, algorithm, uh, uh, is just useful in a, for a certain range of, uh, of cases, of applications. So we uh, have to consider the details of, of uh, methods also. Um, and now I hand over to Martin, so I can step back uh, and play chair uh, after we are finished. And show me the five minutes then. So. Uh, yes. Um, so it's all bad in uh, archaeological uh, classification? I don't think so, because we received a lot of very interesting proposals for talks here. And I think um, this puts a bit of pressure to the presenters. They will show us examples where um, method and object and the data fit very well together, at least we hope. And uh, to guide a bit the hopeful, fruitful discussion later on, we have here some points that you probably could have in mind for later on uh, discussing the different approaches. So the hidden assumptions behind the used methods, what are the methodological limitations of the individual methods? What is the connection between theory and the objective? So what scientific question do I ask and do I have a proper theory that is backing that up? Um, what are the limitations of the data that are available? And is the analysis supports, does the analysis support a narrative? And is this a good thing or is this a bad thing actually? You can think about that. Um, to give some examples, um, so we work a lot in clustering algorithms, so it was natural for us to take examples from that. Um, each clustering algorithm um, detects different kinds of clusters. For example, single linkage detects these chains, while very classical complete linkage detects clusters that are compact in a way and round and so on. While, for example, HDB scan is uh, designed to detect such things as a cluster, but still uh, you have to ask yourself what is actually for you a cluster from a scientific perspective, from, from a, a theoretical perspective. Um, does things that are grouped in that way represent something that is grouped for you, for your specific scientific question, or is probably something else relevant here? And yeah, um, also different cluster algorithms detect different clusters, which mean that they are blind for other kinds of clusters. So what Oliver just presented, you can't put different cluster algorithms uh, to the same data and expect that they should reinforce uh, each other. So that might be a bit problematic. And then you have to think about also what is represented when you um, yeah, summarize your clusters. Usually this is done by presenting an ideal type of this cluster, but for the interpretation it does mean quite a difference if this ideal type really is represented by a real object, or if the ideal type is just something that's computed as the general mean for this cluster. And usually interpretation is done by 
these uh, yeah by the general attributes of the clusters the ideal type so this changes a lot how you can work later on with the data also you have to think about what are the clusters uh, what do the clusters actually represent what is the real world counterpart of them so is it objects is it people is it thoughts uh, and um, concepts of people what is represented from your data through the cluster algorithm towards the result and also um, does your selection of unit of analysis uh, fits with uh, the, the scientific question that you have and your objectives and also for example heterogeneity within the cluster um, is that something that you would consider as an let's say copying error from a cultural evolution perspective or so or is that something that you would allow for these groups should everything within the cluster be as similar as possible or is there a certain range and how can you address this certain range of variability within the clusters so and also uh, what kind of uh, dissimilarity metrics or distance metrics you use influence the results of the cluster and we will here in a minute uh, talk about that um, and it's, it's clear that different distance metrics represents different um, aspects of dissimilarity. For example, if I take the Jakar metric, then I rule out uh, the similar not existing situation of, um, of objects. So similar not uh, represented features. And this change, of course, what the result is representing. Um, okay. So this is our menu for today and I'm looking forward to very, very interesting talks. We have one cancellation here, which gives us probably a bit of extra time for those presenting and probably can prolong our discussion, but we'll see how this will develop. And please note that here's a recording uh, device on the desk. So I would ask the speaker if you don't want to your presentation to be recorded, just indicate and we will turn the recording off them and yeah i think that's it from my side not further much ado um, looking forward to a very nice and interesting session